Hey everyone, and welcome back to another episode of the Hooligard Books Podcast. My guest this week is Simon John Cox, an incredibly gifted author from across the pond, and whose short story, Still, is featured in the Edge of Oblivion anthology, available now for Kendall. Simon's tremendous talent was apparent from the first time I met him back in 2012, following the release of his gripping, not to mention scary as hell book, The Slender Man. Simon has a knack for crafting a good story, whether in the form of short works or full-length novels. He has a way with words that, when coupled with his fresh take on second-person perspective, immerse the reader in a world that can feel frighteningly realistic. Look no further than his all-too-possible depiction of a post-apocalyptic future included in Edge of Oblivion. In this week's episode, Simon speaks candidly about his goal to become traditionally published, his thoughts on the value of reader reviews, and his poignant take on the challenges self-published authors currently face. All this and more in Episode 5 of the Hooligard Books Podcast. Simon Cox, welcome to the Hooligard Books Podcast. How is everything in the UK? Great, thank you. A bit wet, but uh, but otherwise otherwise fine. Well, good. I I know it's very early here, out here on the west coast of the United States, but, uh, but you're probably like, what, late afternoon over there, right? Yeah, it's yeah four in the afternoon. I'm I'm same time zone as as Tony Healy, so I don't know what time you managed to record him. <laughs> I yeah. I don't know. That guy never sleeps, so it could have, <laughs> could have been any time. <laughs> well, actually, since you mentioned Tony Healy, uh, that's one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on the show because I'm I'm having a really good time getting a chance to talk to authors that are contributing stories to the upcoming Edge of Oblivion anthology, uh, which goes live on Amazon Kindle February third. Very excited, uh, you know, to have my own story included, but also uh, I just had a chance to read your story last night, as a matter of fact. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about it. It's called Still, and yep. uh, and it's it's definitely a unique piece for this compilation. Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, Tony actually um, asked me to include this. It's, it's something that I didn't write for the anthology. He asked me if he could include it, which was you know, very flattering, and I was obviously very happy to, because I've been involved with him and other anthologies that he's been in before, and, and the description of this sounded, you know, both interesting in terms of subject and also, you know, what it was trying to achieve from the charity side of things. So for me, it was really easy. He just he just said, you know, can I use it? I said, of course, and so I didn't actually do, do anything. But uh, in terms of the actual story itself, it's post-apocalyptic. My way of looking at what I thought would be important and what would no longer be important after, you know, a fundamental change to the way we live our lives. I've only read a couple of second person pieces before and I, I thought, you know, okay, I'll give it a go. But the reason behind it was because I really wanted to use it to force the reader to put themselves in the protagonist's place. You know, if you, you know, you can have a first person or a third person. Yeah, you can see through their eyes or see over their shoulder, that kind of thing. But this one is almost, you know, telling you that you are involved and almost forcing you into that position. That was the intention anyway. So. Well, yeah, I have to say for me, it was a refreshing change to see a second person story like that because, you know, it brings to mind for me, you know, a really good time of kind of fantasy and RPG where a lot of those stories were told through second person. And it was really cool seeing that you were able to find a way to kind of do that and bring it into the early 2000s. And so I'm wondering, what kind of strategy do you have going into writing a second person story? And what kind of challenges does that put upon you as an author to tell a story like that? Well, I write it in first person and then I do find and replace with I to you. (laughs) I, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> I figured as much. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it, it's. I think you have to be mindful of the fact that you know. You, 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 whereas in a, a third person, you can have a level of omniscience for the narrator. You know, it very much is. You can't really do more than describe what the protagonist is doing or seeing, which is not you know so different from the first person. I think probably what was tricky was going through and, and making it. You know, adjusting it so that it wasn't so much so so directive, if you see what I mean. You know, if if, if you're reading something which just says you do this, you do that, it, it sounds almost like someone's giving you orders. And I, I think that was the that was the difficulty was trying to tone that down and more making it a description in which you are in the midst of the action rather than being ordered to do things, if you see what I mean. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 
what I really appreciated about the story still was how clever you weaved the second person into it and how you were able to kind of attack that with a fresh take on the genre, which has really all but disappeared. I really appreciate that as a reader. So fantastic job on that. Thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed writing it so much that I, I decided to use it as part of the novel that I'm working on. So while, while we're still on the subject of short stories, when I first met you, uh, digitally I suppose, was right about the time that you had put out Distant Machines, which was a, a collection of three short stories uh, back in, was that 2012, like early 2012? I think it was 2012, yes. Okay. Yes. My memory uh, gets worse and worse the older I get. Uh, <laughs> I remember picking that up very, very early uh, after I'd met you and, and really enjoyed it. Yeah, I talked about this with Courtney Cantrell, who's one of the other authors contributing to the anthology, and I found it kind of a, a fascinating topic about what your mindset is, you know, or, or how your process differs between writing novels and short stories, because you do both. And, you know, her and I kind of had some similarities, but I, I'm wondering for from your perspective, how does your process differ between novels and short stories? Well, I suppose that the, the process itself doesn't change greatly. I, I think the, the, the main thing for me that I think may differ between me and other author is that I have to have a beginning and an end before I can start. Or rather, if I don't have one, the piece never finishes. I've got so many pieces where I just have an interesting idea. I get started without really knowing where I'm going with it. And it just never ends. They're, they're, I, I can't finish it off. So everything I write, I always have to have before I write a single word, I have to have an idea of, of where the beginning is and where it's going to end up. I mean, it can change as it goes on, but that needs to be more or less there before I even get started. And that's true for shorter pieces or for longer pieces. What else I think is common between the two is that generally I write about things that kind of are on my mind at that time. One of the things that was on my mind whilst, and what prompted me to, to write the, the novel that I'm currently editing is the idea that our existence is shaped by our interactions with other people. So, you know, and so that makes me think, okay, what, what are the extremes there? You know, could you have someone who was born um, and lived completely solitarily, never met anyone and then died? That's the same as not existing, isn't it? Because if no one's ever met him and he doesn't write anything down, he doesn't leave anything behind, you know, the same as never having existed is what I thought. So I thought, okay, well, could that be put into a novel? And so that, that kind of thing is what shapes the um, the theme uh, and that in turn shapes the, the story and that that's true from a short story level right up to a novel level so often what you'll see if you read some of my shorts because there's more of them about is you'll just see what was kind of bouncing around in my skull at the time isn't that kind of cool when you think about it like you, you look back at your short stories and, and they are like a road map you know of, of kind of where mm -hmm. your, your where your thought process and your creative process was at that particular moment it's like a neat little snapshot of how, uh, well, in some cases, of how messed up your brain is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, it, you know, we talked about short stories and novels, and shortly after Distant Machines, I was very honored to be selected as a participant in your beta read for The Slender Man. You know, one of the things about The Slender Man was that it was such a captivating mystery and I hate throwing around terms like page turner because it's such a cliche for, for writers. But but I, I really, I mean, I, I could not put that thing down. Uh, I read it in one sitting, which for me is, is extremely rare. Getting back to my original point, as I digress, mm -hmm. as I often do, thinking back on on The Slender Man and, and seeing, you know, kind of this, this really positive response from readers – does that get motivational for you to to want to sit down and work on the next piece? Or do you feel a sense of frustration that, that you, you you write a, a piece of acclaimed work that maybe isn't getting uh, the attention that you think, you know, a story with this much fan feedback should be receiving? I, I don't feel motivated or demotivated by it because I'm, I'm going to write anyway. I write whether people read it or not because I enjoy it and because I kind of feel I have to. As far as the Slender Man uh, book was concerned, I'm, you know, overwhelmed by the response to it. And I'm, I'm, you know, obviously delighted at the number of people who've read it. Obviously, I'd like more people to have read it, but the fact that anyone's read it, you know, makes me very, very happy. Mm -hmm. In terms of the actual reviews themselves, um, I actually stopped reading reviews as a result of that book. Not that I read them too much before, but I stopped reading them simply because I got one one-star review on some site because they said, oh, you, you know, 
slips into first person here and there, first person, present tense or something. The whole thing is written first person, present tense. So I don't know what that was about. <laughs> um, and then on the other end of the spectrum, I got a five star review from someone who just said, this looks amazing. I'm definitely going to buy this. I've just read the preview. I, so I, I don't know. I kind of think that's, that's not helpful. Neither of those reviews are helpful. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm just pleased that people have been reading it uh, and mostly enjoying it. As a quick anecdotal example that happened just a couple of days ago, Friday, I, I, I was in a bar and I, I bumped into a friend I haven't seen for a couple of years. First thing he said was, oh, I read your book. And I said, okay, my, my answer was, which one? <laughs> He said, oh, the Slender Man one. Uh, I go, oh, brilliant. What did you think? He said, it scared the shit out of me. <laughs> so, you know, it's not, it's not nice to think you've scared someone because that's kind of a weird feeling. But obviously in a book that's supposed to, it, it, it's good. But slightly odd to think that you scared someone by proxy <laughs> in, the, in, in the distance. I tell you, it, scared, it scared me writing it. I gave myself nightmares when I was writing that. It, that's genuinely true. I had three days of nightmares as I was plotting it out and writing the main bits. It was because I because I wrote I wrote what scares me. I just that book is just a, a, a story that scares me. So mm-hmm. the fact that it scares other people is a bonus. <laughs> so on the subject of uh, reader feedback, uh, you know, you'd mentioned that you you'd stopped reading feedback kind of as a result of of what had happened with the Slender Man. And I was going to ask you about that because I, I think as a writer, you know, you you have to have very thick skin to put out something that's so personal to you. You know, you spend uh, months or, or even years and, and, you know, God knows how much money uh, getting these stories out there for people to read. And because it's the internet and because it's 2014, people have the ability to say kind of the most horrible things. And, and sometimes they don't even feel like constructive. Uh, well, actually a lot of the time they don't feel constructive. They're just more of an attack. And I, and I wonder how does that impact you as an author? You'd mentioned one that, you, that you'd gotten from a website. It, maybe it was just a, a disconnect between you know reader and writer there. But how do you shield yourself from these types of, of negative feedbacks that can come from people without you know without warning? Yeah, it's an interesting one, and I think I because I, I've been I've been writing in some form or another for years and years, publishing only more recently, but writing the whole time. And I think I've just developed a thicker skin. Uh, over time, partly because I realized that it just doesn't matter. The feedback really doesn't matter that much. Mm-hmm. In that sense, I think you just learn to ignore it. And equally, you know, it's it's all subjective. You know, I can go onto Amazon right now and I can find a book that's rated five stars that I hate and a book that's overall one star that I loved. You know, it's just, it, it's opinion. Mm-hmm. And then in terms of the... The fact that, you know, maybe people say quite hurtful things or, or quite insulting things. I haven't really experienced that too much. I have a bit. You just, you just ignore it, really. It's, you know, you'll never meet these people. They don't really have any direct effect on your life. And the important thing is that if some people like your book, then you're, you're doing well. You know, that's, that's fine. If more people don't like it, well, never mind. As long as some people do, <laughs> that's it. And as long as you write the thing that you want to write and you're doing it how you want to do it and you feel it's, it's of a quality and standard um, and integrity that you can live with, then that's that, you know. Well, that's a very healthy outlook on it. You know, cause I, I, I know I've got other friends you know, that also write books, and some can be a, a bit more sensitive. And, and I find myself, you know, sometimes somebody will say something about one of my books that it, it does kind of catch me off guard at first. And it, it's not that it that it's a knife to the heart so much as it is the disconnect sometimes, I, I think, is what frustrates me. Because I, I wonder if if the disconnect is because I didn't bring the, the reader into my story or if there's something that I didn't communicate well enough. And, and it makes me frustrated with myself more than anything. But I go back and, and my first book has, I think, 21 uh, total reviews and like 18 of them are five star. And like, you know, like you said, you know, you're, you're, you're proud to see that and, and you're happy that you've entertained people, but it's always those, those other three <laughs> that kind of, kind of stick in my brain a little bit. And I just think, God, if I just, you know, if I just tweaked one or two things, could I have turned that, you know, that two star review into a four, but I, but you're right. It, it's, it's accepting it, being proud of what you've done and moving on. So I really appreciate your healthy outlook on that. It's, it's really cool to hear. There will always be some people who hate you, what you do, no matter what it is. So 
just accept it, really. <laughs> Well, one of the things that, that I love about 2014, in addition to being able to talk about all the things I hate with anonymity, uh, <laughs> is, uh, is the ability to, to self-publish. And I know that this is a, a topic of conversation that gets debated back and forth between authors. Uh, and I wanted to get your take on it because you, know, you and I are both kind of in the, in the independent author circuit. You've discussed trying to attract an agent uh, with an upcoming novel that you're working on. So I, I wanted to get your thoughts on kind of how you feel about the current state of self-publishing and if, if traditional publishing is more of the route you wanted to go or if it's, if it's something that you've, uh, that you've been thinking about because of your experience self-publishing. I think, I think, you know, traditional publishing and, and electronic digital self-publishing can coexist. People are talking about the traditional publishing world being in trouble. I think, I think it is. I don't think it's on its last legs uh, by any means, and nor will it be for some time. I think when it comes to traditional publishing, I'm a traditionalist and I've grown up with it. When it comes to my writing, I don't think I'll ever feel like I've succeeded until I've had a traditional publisher say, yes, that's good enough for me to publish. And that's what I'm looking for. And so I'm doing that with my novels um, because that's what I consider my, in inverted commas, proper writing. The, the, the short stories, as I've said, I kind of see as writing exercises and and ways of raising awareness and just you know fun for me. I kind of I use I use the novel and the short stories to to spur me on to do both because I'm inherently lazy. So when I when I should be you know, when I should be working on the novel, I kind of get a short story on the go because then I think oh, I'll skive off the novel and then I write a short story because I should be writing the novel. And equally, I try and do some short story. Um, projects because then I go oh I can't be bothered to write this short story and so I go back to the novel so I do both to keep me keep me uh, focused I don't know. <laughs> bit perverse, but it, it kind of works so so yeah I think I, I, I'd like an agent for the work you know as as self publishers as electronic publishers we're up against it in that if you go into a, a physical bookshop you know uh, the number of titles in there is overwhelming. And those are all traditionally published, and that's just a subset of what is traditionally published. You go onto any online store, and you've got that, and it's exponentially bigger. The chances of us being discovered by anyone uh, and read by any significant number of people is, is much, much smaller without that backing of a traditional publisher. On top of that as well, you know, there is still that, that back of the mind um, feeling that if you are a self-published author, if you aren't, if you are outside of the traditional publishing world, the quality is lower, the level of editing is lower. I do see a, the quality is highly variable. And that's also true of printed, you know, traditional fiction. And I, I have to say, I've read a lot of traditionally published ebooks now that are far worse edited than, than my books are. But then I am a, a horrible pedant and I have proofreading and copy editing qualifications. Mm -hmm. So, so, you know, my, my ebooks are impeccable I would like to think um, and I've seen plenty of errors in, in books that I've paid good money for so I think I think it's that really I think for me I kind of exist in both worlds I'm, I, I talk about oh just if, if a few people read it and like it that's good enough for me but ultimately I've got the kind of the back of the mind the dream that it would be lovely to do this for a living and I don't think that's possible for what I do without the backing of a traditional publisher and equally you know I've got that kind of self-doubt that Without that backing, I'll never really be able to say that my work was good enough. You touched on something that, that I think about a lot when, uh, when it comes to self-publishing, and, and that is, you know, as, as self-publishers, we have more of, a, of an obligation, I think, to produce something of great quality. Um, and, and when I say that, I mean that kind of the, the burden of quality is more prevalent on, on a self-published author because you have much more to prove because you're in a sea of, of other works that may or may not be as well edited or, or may not have professional covers. So you really have to make sure that what you're doing stands out because you're going to be judged against perception, right? Like, and maybe, maybe an unfair perception at that. But yeah. to your point exactly, picking up a well-known author's work and finding more errors in, in a traditionally published book than you might find in a self-published book, I, I think that that's, that's a trend that I'm starting to see more, that self-published work is, is so 
so much more polished these days than it was when I published my first book. And, and I'll be honest, when I published my first book, I didn't know the first thing about a proper editing process. And, and I put out something that, you know, could definitely have been better. And I took a, a, a year working with a, you know, with an editor to fix it because I, I didn't want to have just another sloppy, you know, self-published work out there because I could, you know, and, and throw a 99 cent price tag on it and just say, well, it was only a dollar. So, you know, if, if you found a typo or missing word, then who cares? But anyway, like I, I, I just I really like hearing that perspective because uh, it, it echoes what, what I'm seeing in, in traditional publishing. And I think about that, you know, like I, I think about the time and effort that goes into making sure as a self-published author that my name is attached to something of great polish and quality. And, yeah. and, and anymore, I wonder if traditional publishing can offer that, you know, or if traditional publishing is just more of a measuring stick to say my work is now good enough you know, to be mentioned, you know, in the same breath as somebody that readers may have already heard of. Yeah, I, I think I think that's part of it. It's, you know, if these guys published X and they published Y, then Y must be in the same ballpark as X. Yeah. And there is still the perception, as you say, of, of the level of polish um, that goes into those books. And you're absolutely right. You know, people like you and me need to put that extra time in to, to, to make the difference between something that looks a bit shoddy and something that actually looks professional. But it, it, the biggest problem that we have to overcome is that, you know, what we're doing there is you're effectively uh, polishing, a, polishing a single apple in a grocery store. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's, that's the equivalent of your traditional bookshop. But then really, what we're doing, where we're operating, is we're spending our time polishing this single apple that's on a pile of other apples that's in an entire supermarket. Uh, and people are, you know, the chances of them even walking past the pile of apples is, is low. And then in that respect, actually picking up yours is even smaller. So if they do pick it up, yeah, they'll see it's good quality. They'll see it's edited well. Hopefully they'll read an, in, uh, an excerpt and think, oh, I'd like to continue reading this. The problem we have is getting, you know, getting eyeballs in front of it. And this is why I think, you know, the traditional print bookshop, it's in trouble, but it's, I don't think it's going away soon because there are some things, and I think books is one of them, that people still like to browse by hand. Mm -hmm. um, yep. I don't know about you, but I, I cannot browse Amazon. I just can't. It just, it's too overwhelming. There's too much there. I don't particularly like the time it takes to, <laughs> the time it takes to load up the excerpts. It, it's seconds, but that shows that, that we're in 2014. <laughs> Having to wait three or four seconds is too long. Uh, <laughs> it's less time than picking up a book and opening it. But but that's it, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think the biggest hurdle, well, two biggest hurdles now, two big hurdles to overcome are one is is getting people in front of our work, and two is just the sheer volume of equivalent work that's out there that is just dwarfing ours. There's only so much you can do to, to raise yours to prominence. And everyone else is trying to do the same, right? Yep. You know, it's not, they're not just putting it out there and leaving it. We're all doing the same thing. Um, it's very, very noisy um, and it's tough. So, you know, that, that's why I kind of accept a few people reading it and liking it, that's good. And hopefully they'll tell some other people and they'll buy it and, or, or read it if it's free or whatever and it'll just give people some pleasure. But then, yeah, with the stuff that I've put the most effort into, I want to have the highest chance of it being found. So that's that's kind of the reasoning behind my idea for the traditional publishing for the novel. Mm -hmm. Well, and I want to talk about that because you, you, you mentioned trying to get your work in progress wrapped up, right? You've got a second novel. Yeah. That, is, it, is it just about finished or are you still kind of doing some tweaks and, and editing? Uh, if you could see me right now next to my laptop, uh, there's a half inch thick part of manuscript covered in red ink. So <laughs> um, it's at that stage. It's, uh, I've, I've gone through it on the screen, tidied it up, tightened it up a bit, gone, gone through some typos, got that, and then I've printed it out and done the same thing, tried to tighten it where possible. And I'm just implementing those changes, rewriting a few bits. Once that's done, I'll send it out to some people to read and get their feedback, do a third round of editing. And after that, I think I'll probably be in a position to start thinking about sending it out to people. So it's fairly well advanced, but, you know, it, it's not ready to go yet. And that, again, I don't, I don't know how many people would do three rounds of edits. Mm -hmm. or, or, you know, the barriers to 
self-publishing is so low, I think, you know, what we need is a computer these days and you just put it on the Kindle desktop publishing or Smashwords or something like that. All you need to be able to do is upload something that's there. No one needs to, needs to do any of the editing. This is what I meant to, mentioned integrity earlier and the quality of the product. I wouldn't feel good if I hadn't done these three rounds of editing. It's moving along, but I think it's, it's, it's got a little way to go. Yeah, and then, then I have an, another another novel that's finished and just sitting on my hard drive gathering electronic dust. <laughs> um, you know, I, uh, and this was one I tried I tried to, to generate some interest from agents with probably a couple of years ago now. It's, it's in a fairly good state. People who've read it, enjoyed it. I think, you know, agents typically ask for the first 10,000 words, the first chapter. So I'd, I'd, I'd sent that kind of thing out, and um, the general response when I got any kind of feedback was that it was not commercial enough. You know, there was a couple of agents who came back and said, like your writing, like the turn of phrase, this one's not quite right for us, but please contact us in future with other work, which is which is in, in encouraging. It makes, you know, you, they think you can write, but um, just that this one isn't quite what they're looking for. I think I'd agree. It starts slowly and, and then accelerates. So... Um, it's the kind of one that I think you do need to stick with, and I've, I've tried to tighten that start as much as I can, but I just I think I can't see the wood for the trees anymore. Um, so I don't know what I can do to make it make it more compelling to begin with. So I've put it to one side and working on the other. And what I'm hoping is if this one has any more success with the agents, it's maybe I've, and, they, and if anyone picks it up, they might say, "Do you have anything else?" I can say, "Well, as it happens, I do," and then, then maybe they can suggest some changes. But um, at the moment, I can't see. How to improve it. Yeah. So, what else is in store for you for 2014? Do you do you have another novel already lined up in your head, or, or are you going to work on some more short stories? Uh, yeah, both. You know, I, as I said, you know, I, I use the novels to make me write short stories, and I use the short stories to make me work on my novel. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm lazy and very good at procrastinating. But uh, I, I think nothing formal outside of the um, finishing this one. I do have ideas. For a couple of novels, I think there's always things bubbling around in my head. As I said, you know, there's always something I'm thinking about which will be either something that could develop into a short story or if it's got a bit more depth to it, develop into something longer. As it happens, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote Kids' Story, just a, a you know, 1,000, 2,000 words, something like that. No, less than that, about 1,000 words. So nothing too long because some children of a friend of mine asked me to. So I wrote an extremely silly story. I didn't actually write it for them. I wrote it for, it's, it's a kid's story, but it's mostly aimed at immature adults. Um, <laughs> by which I, basically, I wrote it for myself. Um, and so there's, there's jokes in it that they definitely won't get, but any adult reading it will. But they, they read it, they liked it, they showed it to their classmates, they all liked it, so I thought, oh, maybe I could write a few more of these. So I don't know, maybe I might do some kids' stories this year as well. Well, that's very cool. Well, I can see here that we have uh, we've reached the end of our podcast time, which is unfortunate because these uh, these interviews are always so much fun <laughs> that I could probably go on for for way more time. But thank you so much for for joining us on the podcast this week. I'm very excited for the Edge of Oblivion anthology. Again, that's coming out on February 3rd for Amazon Kindle. Simon still is a fantastic piece of work. Slender Man was a fantastic piece of work, and I'm I'm sure that. We have not heard the last of you, and I'm really looking forward to seeing uh, what you come up with next. Thanks so much, and thanks so much for having me on here. It's been it's been really interesting, and I just looked at my watch. I didn't realize the time's gone so quickly. I hope 